Hi, this is Clark on Temptress. Today we're going to do a video I probably should have done long ago. I've mentioned BMSs a lot, but you know, I haven't done a straightforward, simple video describing what one of these does and what one of these doesn't do. Today we're gonna dive into what is a BMS. There's one in every lithium ion phosphate battery, why it's important, and uh, what you can expect it to do and what you can't expect it to do. This is a BMS I took out of a battery. Let's talk about what a BMS does. Lithium iron phosphate cells, and here's some right here. There's four of them, which makes all together a 12 volt battery. They're on the order of about three-ish volts, a little bit more. And uh, you put them in series and you can make any voltage you want, a multiple of that number, of course. If that was all there was to it, and that's kind of like what lead is, just a certain cell of a certain voltage and you put them together, um, that we would have a battery. And it would make a battery, it would work. The problem is lithium iron phosphate cells, though they are really tremendous in lots of ways, they have low internal resistance, they're really efficient, they have a lot of cy cycle life, they are fragile, they, if you do the wrong thing to them, you can destroy them immediately. And if you do the sort of wrong thing to them for a while, you can shorten their life greatly. The BMS, its job is to make sure that you don't do the things that destroy them immediately. And that's really all a BMS is for. So the way you can kill lithium ion phosphate cells is if you charge them too much, greatly too much, their voltage will start skying up. And I'll do some graphics later that will let you see what I mean by that. If the voltage goes way too high, even for a little while, they burn, they build up internal pressure and they have uh, some vents on them. They'll pop the vents and you will lose everything. Let's actually pull this battery out so we could take a look. So if I were to charge just one cell, for example, and I charged it a uh, high, like by the time I hit four volts, I think it would probably do the, what I'm talking about. This vent will pop. The internal pressure will go out and the battery will dry out inside and basically it won't be a, a cell anymore. It'll just be a, a block of plastic and chemistry. So you can kill them more or less instantly by overcharging them greatly. You can kill them uh, more or less in, uh, instantly by undercharging them. If you take the voltage too low, there's a good chance they won't take power again. Though I have, uh, this very cell has gone down to very low voltage and seems to have survived quite nicely. So uh, anyway, definitely a way they can die, but maybe not quite so assured as going too far. The other one you've heard of is thermal runaway. And uh, this is what you see when cell phones and particularly scooter batteries uh, burst into flames and burn down a house. That's not so much a thing with these lithium iron phosphate cells, which is why I do endorse people putting these on boats. The other batteries are just too dangerous for the boat environment. Uh, my joke, but it's not a joke. If you're crossing an ocean and your batteries uh, go into thermal runaway because you had lithium ion batteries, your big choice that day is, do I burn or do I drown? And that's just not acceptable on a boat. Car, you can hit the brakes real hard and jump out and watch it burn, but a boat, it's just much more of a commitment. Anyway, thermal runaway doesn't really happen very often with lithium iron phosphate, partly because the BMS has a thermal pickup. And if things get too hot inside the case, it shuts down charging or discharging. So that's another thing that the BMS has to do at a minimum. So don't overcharge them greatly so they pop. Don't undercharge them so they're totally flat and don't let them get hot. If it doesn't have those things, it's not a BMS. Um, often they add onto it a feature that says if too much power is being drawn out of them, stop them. Uh, they'll call that short circuit protection. They'll call that over amp protection. Very often, all it is, is when too much is drawn out, things get hot, and when things get hot, it shuts down. But the more sophisticated ones actually watch amps. Generally, if it's a digital BMS, um, 
And the best way you're gonna know that is all the Bluetooth ones are digital BMS. Uh, then it's going to do things in a, a software way where it's probably actually watching amps. And if it's a cheap one without Bluetooth, there's a good chance it's just thermal based. As far as the base functionality, thermal kind of does the job. Like I said, that's chiefly what a BMS is there for. Keep the cells from destroying them themselves. Now there's some other features that can be added. Um, I really like when, because of usually a Bluetooth device that they've added to this so I can get an app on my phone, I can see the cells voltages of the individual cells. There's no practical way to do that any other way because if they actually took these sensing wires and brought them outside the case, if these were to short, that would be unprotected shorts of the cells and well, really bad things will happen. So it's really not safe to bring these wires out so you could test them with probes. Um, the, the safe thing to do is let the computer in the BMS know that information, which it kind of needs to do to do its job and then report it outside with radio. Best thing, everything can be waterproof, that's great. Sadly, a lot of the newest BMSs are saying, don't worry your little head about the cell voltage. We're so smart, we're gonna take care of that for you. That's almost an absolute proof that they're not taking care of it right. Um, they are probably hiding something that they've done with software that didn't come out the way they wanted it to. And they said, well, they're gonna find out how we're cheating. So we're taking that information away from them. Uh, that won't last long if we don't buy batteries that have uh, individual cell reporting. So when you want to buy a battery, one thing you can do is look at the screen uh, where they're selling it on Amazon or whatever. When they show a picture of the app, you can look at it and very often you can see cell voltage reporting or not. If you can't rely on someone that's done a review, whether I've done a review or not, there's other people doing reviews and they certainly should talk about that or um, just, uh, you know, find a forum, whatever, wherever you talk to other people like-minded to yourself and just say, hey, anybody use this LI time? Does it tell me cell voltages? Anyway, cell voltage, real important. Another thing that a BMS can do is watch the cell temperatures at the low end. That's important too. If you were to freeze this cell or these cells, that's fine. You can store them frozen. And strangely, you can take power out of them when they're frozen, not too low, but you know, when they're just a bit of below freezing. And apparently that's just fine. But if you try to put power into them when they're frozen, it will destroy them pretty quickly. So a lot of BMSs have the thermal pickup, you know, particularly the digital ones that uh, monitor the, the cell temperature. And of course, they're, like I said, they're gonna shut down if it gets hot but they'll also shut down the ability to charge them if it gets too cold. This is important. If you have a charge control system that isn't under your control, read solar, and you're putting the battery in a situation where it could freeze, campers in particular. Even if your camper like mine is in Florida, um, it's important to have that feature in your BMS because I wanna to go to the Rocky Mountains and I might kind of forget about all the details. And overnight, maybe I let the camper get cold. Um, I run a furnace when I'm there, but maybe I park it and for some reason use a hotel room or very likely I visit friends. I visit friends and viewers all over the world when I travel and they invite me into a nice comfortable bed and I take them up on it and my camper freezes overnight, no problem. And then in the morning, the solar panels start putting out power and the batteries are still frozen. Bang, I could lose all my lithium batteries. So having a BMS that can protect your batteries, if they're gonna be exposed to freezing, even on a possibility, is well worth the money in my opinion. The Bank Manager Gen 3 has the ability to protect your batteries from freezing, but kind of in a bad way. I mean, it works but it's not anywhere near as elegant as what this can do from the inside of the case. So I recommend this over this. If you have this feature, don't even install the thermal pickup on this guy. Of course, if you're on a boat and you're living your life right, that means you're in the tropics. You can forget about cold weather, it just won't happen. The other thing we need out of the BMS is we need a BMS to be able to balance the cells. Now, these cells are kind of all like individual batteries. And 
if one is charged to 100% and one is charged to 80%, that's a bad thing. Um, first off, the outside charge controller systems are getting wrong voltages and, and kind of can't make good decisions. And because of those bad decisions, the cell that's at 100% is probably going to get overcharged uh, while the system is trying to bring them all up. So we need to get these batteries, these cells, balanced. I have a video on how to do that to virtually any battery with any BMS. Follow those instructions. They will work. Sometimes it takes a long time. Sometimes it happens really fast. Uh, the biggest thing that makes it happen fast is if your BMS has what's called active balancing. The other thing is called passive balancing, which I think is a stupid name because there's nothing really passive about it. They just chose a word that's the opposite of active. But the ones that are passive, uh, well, I'm going to go into that in another video because balancing is a big deal and how they do it is a big deal and we can't do too much at one time, right? So enough said that a BMS is responsible for balancing the cells. Let's take a look at how cells actually charge. Now, if you make a little graph, or I make a little graph, and I put voltage on this axis, and I put a percent of charge on this axis, and I just look at one cell, um, you get this shape, this very distinctive shape of lithium. You get a, a shape like this. We call the, uh, the ends of it the hockey stick, because it's shaped like a hockey stick. There's one at the low end, and there's another one at the high end. Notice that in the middle of charge, lithium doesn't change its voltage much at all. It's a very, very, very flat curve here. This is why it's really hard to tell if a lithium iron phosphate battery is at 30% charge or 80% charge. Um, you just don't get that information. Lead was more linear in how uh, its voltage to charge worked, and you could, you could do things just on voltage. Also, you can charge lead very effectively by voltage. If you try that with lithium, you will fail. This charge, let's call this the charging curve because the voltages shift when you're charging and discharging. There's a lot going on to this. There's really an awful lot going on this. But if you charge at a certain rate, you would get a curve like that. If you charged at a different rate, let's say we charged at a, um, a, a higher uh, amperage, we actually end up getting something that's shaped more like that. And if we charged at a much, much slower rate, we would get something that would look more like that. Well, this is why you can't charge to a voltage um, with a charging system that's designed for lithium phosphate. Because what is the right answer? When do I stop charging? Well, if I'm charging fast, I can actually go to a very, very high voltage before I'm at 100%. But if I'm charging low, I better stop way down here at this voltage. It's just how the beast is. And if you could do this in a lab where you can control the charging rate because you're plugged into the mains and there's nothing going on, you can use this kind of a graph to decide when 100% has been reached. Uh, I should, probably should put that in here. 100% isn't this peak voltage when the cells are about to explode. 100% is really probably like right there. And it looks arbitrary. It's not. It is a, a point where if you charge the batteries beyond it, they will start damaging themselves. Not instantly, but they will greatly shorten their life. I've found from people getting back to me, uh, customers for the bank manager, viewers, you know, people that are using lithium. Um, one guy in particular was in the Dominican Republic when I was developing the bank manager and we're talking in a bar over beers and I told him about it. He goes, I don't need that. My system's working great. And uh, he, his system was working great. And then he uh, left the Dominican Republic and two years later, he came back to the Dominican Republic and, hey Clark, can I buy one of those bank managers? Um, his batteries lasted three years. Uh, I can't guarantee how long a battery is going to last, but I feel that this bank manager thing 
This is it, by the way. I'm, I'm not trying to turn everything into commercial for the bank manager, but it's the only thing that does this. Um, what I do is a charge cycle and, and stopping charge at the right time should make these batteries last like 14 years of daily cycling. So you should get a lot more life out of them. But back to this. Um, <clears throat> if you're in an active environment, uh, where you're charging with solar and clouds exist. Uh, throughout the day, it's putting out different amps, and then a cloud comes over, and the amps go down, and the cloud goes away, and it comes back on. Which of these curves are you on? It's changing all the time. You don't know. Also, you could be charging at a pretty solid current, but the refrigerator comes on, and then it goes off. And that takes power that was destined to go to the battery and redirects it to the refrigerator. Again, you don't know what curve you're on. It's a very dynamic world. And from solving this problem, and I, I was a good engineer. I was able to retire in my 30s. Uh, it took me three weeks to solve this math. It really is complicated. And it's so much more than just amps and volts. There's a history component. There's just a lot to it to make a system that works in the real world. So back to this. This is how they charge. You want to stop at 100%. There's really no way that a BMS can know you're at 100%. Uh, and also, that's not really what it's attempting to do, and it shouldn't be attempting to stop at 100%. It should be stopping before the batteries immediately damage themselves, and that's a good BMS job, full stop. Because there's actually times when you need to charge above 100% for a little while, and that's when you're balancing the cells. Back to these curves, if we were to compare a battery, we'll use the black line here, that was, let's say, 30% full. And a, when I say battery, I mean cells for this whole discussion. I'm sorry that I keep using the wrong word. So one that's at 30% and one that's at 80%, well, their voltage is essentially identical. So if we compare these two cells, and they're really out of balance, but they have exactly the same voltage, we have no way of knowing it. So we can't balance them. As we charge the cells more and more, they go up into the hockey stick, and this is where voltages change very rapidly. In fact, if you don't have a BMS, it's so easy to have this runaway where they just pop. I've done it in this lab uh, and ruined perfectly good battery cells when they were expensive. <laughs> so um, I can tell you it can happen without the BMS watching over. So when you're up here, you can really tell the difference between, let's say, 105 and 103%. It's a big voltage difference. So to be able to balance the cells, you have to come way over charge, way over 100%. And then you can look at the cells and see how different they are. And generally, you take the battery and charge it up until one of the cells is really close to the shut the battery off line, and then just try to hold it there. And then the BMS will do whatever magic it does to balance the cells until the other cells' voltages can catch up. So we're kind of like stopping the charge of the top cell and letting the other ones come up to the same point. When all the cells are at the same voltage, then we want to get it right on down out of that area. And uh, for the rest of the use of the battery, we just want to play in this area. Uh, and only occasionally, maybe every year, go up and check its state of balance. If it's way out of balance, maybe the next time we do it six months. And if it's right in balance, maybe we go two years. We start learning that set of cells. I think that's about it. Um, that is what a BMS does, what it should do, what you should expect out of it, and you shouldn't expect out of it. Um, I hope this is helpful. If you like the video, send me a comment so I know to do more of these kind of basic electronics videos. I think everybody that owns lithium iron phosphate has to know what these beasts are, at least so that you don't have to open the case and you can kind of know what's going on on the inside. Uh, it also will tell us as consumers what features we should look for and, uh, you know, which ones we should spend money on, which ones we shouldn't. Anyway, bye from Clark on Temptress. Good day to y'all.